species down. So things like um, the soil microbes and other organisms um, can start breaking them down further. So they play a role in decomposition. Um, they can be soil conditioners. So we have a lot of um, insects or spiders rather that are going to live in the soil, that they're going to turn over soil. They might be burrowing in soil. And so they might be able to, you know, bring some of that leaf litter closer to the ground where it can then be exposed to microbes that further break it down. And of course, they can be food sources for others. So of course there are um, great predatory services and we'll start there with some of our um, easy to answer things. You know, we know that spiders are predators. Here we have a little video of a funnel weaver spider that is um, sinking its fangs into, it looks like to be an ant to paralyze it. Um, so they're chief among small predators um, and pests and they're gonna kill some of the pests that we have to deal with. Um, from the Ohio Spider Survey, there's about 682 species in Ohio, maybe more, um, and 19% of all North American species are found in crops eating pests like locusts, moths, flies, um, and so that's a great service that they're providing to us. Um, and then there can be over a thousand to a half million spider individuals per acre of grassland. But of course, we're here part of the Woodland Steward Program talking about spiders of our forest. And we can find 8,000 to 930,000 spiders per acre of forest. And so even though we might be more accustomed to thinking of them um, in a field or where there's flowers or where there might be open areas, um, anyone who's scouted a cornfield has probably gotten a spider web to the face. Um, they are in our forests and um, we can appreciate them there. So Richard Bradley in his book, In Ohio's Backyard Spiders, states that forest species are more commonly found in the south and east unglaciated portions of the state and field and open country species are more often found in the Northwest glaciated parts of Ohio. Now that kind of makes sense because where those um, glaciers were, they made a lot of changes to the landscape. And so you could see where you might find more species in an area that was less disturbed um, historically, but we can find a lot of species in, in forests all around um, Ohio. So let's do a quick crash course in spiders. Um, so I am a crazy cat lady. So anytime I could compare a spider to a cat, I'm gonna do it. Um, so let's not get into the weeds yet. Let's start with basic spiders 101. So with some quick taxonomy, they are members of the phylum Arthropoda. So they have jointed appendages, kind of like a suit of armor. They have that hard exoskeleton. Um, we have a um, segments. So here we see other kinds of arthropods. So shrimps, um, lobsters, uh, crabs. These are isopods or roly polies. All those segments are common in arthropods. My slides don't advance. There we go. Um, so they are in the subphylum Chelicerata, and that comes from the Chelicerae on spiders and other um, Chelicerates. So here you see uh, what looks to be the spider's fangs, but the Chelicerae are the whole part, and the fangs are actually at the bottom. Um, the Chelicerae are uh, just tipped with those fangs, and the Chelicerae are hollow and are connected to venom glands. Um, in other species, those Chelicerae might be used for grooming. Um, they might have little teeth on them to help with that. Um, and this includes groups like the horseshoe crabs, sea spiders, and the arachnids. So spiders are in the class arachnida. Um, and so this is not just spiders. So you think about arachnophobia, we think, oh, it's just a fear of spiders. Not necessarily because other arachnids include uh, scorpions, pseudoscorpions, opiliones, um, acari, and the Uranii, the true spiders. And then of course they're in order Uranii and um, Ohio has about 40 families of spiders, but 93% of all spiders found in our region are made up of about 20 different families that we focus on. Um, in total, North America has 68 families and um, we know that there's about 119 known families worldwide. Um, it's considered the largest order of arachnids 
Uh, there are over 48,000 species um, identified worldwide. Um, all spiders have eight legs, generally six to eight eyes, but some species may have um, fewer eyes because maybe they're cave dwelling. Um, they have two body regions, the cephalothorax and the abdomen. Again, that exoskeleton, no antenna and no wings. Um, one of the big uh, great characteristics of spiders is that they can spin silk. And so spiders can have two to four pairs of spinnerets. Um, the spinnerets have many spigots that exude silk from silk glands. Um, this is a wonderful picture of an Australian garden orb weaver. Um, and so those um, obviously aren't native to Ohio, but you get a great shot of those um, spinnerets um, at the back here. You see that there are uh, three pairs and they're exuding that silk. Um, the spiders can actually make different kinds of webs using those different spigots and their spinnerets. Some might be silky, um, some are sticky, some might be thicker than others. It's flexible, it's strong. Um, you've probably heard about how, you know, oh, if only we could, you know, make our own spider silk, you know, that would be better than Kevlar, we could make ropes out of it. Still working on that, I think, um, but we know that it's a really wonderful substance. Um, spiders do not shoot webs. Um, they have to lay it down and then walk away from it or they'll pull it out of, from the spinnerets um, with their legs. Um, the webbing begins as a liquid in the body and then it's, uh, the proteins arrange as strings as it's pooled. Um, so unlike the comics, there's no web shooting in spiders. Marnie, I see some hands raised. I don't know if uh, you wanna interject with a question, but um, I'll keep going, but feel free to stop me if you'd like. Okay, um, I'll check it out. So of course, um, as I mentioned, different kinds of spider webs. So if we take a look at this traditional orb shaped web, we can see that there are non sticky anchor threads, sticky spiral threads, um, and non sticky radial threads. And so the spider knows which ones stick and which ones don't. And they're able to walk across their web without getting stuck, whereas a unsuspecting victim flies into it and gets tangled up in those sticky threads in this traditional um, example. Um, there is something here called the stablementum. And you might see this um, in a lot of orb webs that are really big and showy because it's usually a nice, you know, distinct characteristic. It's a big zigzag, zigzag in the web. Um, currently, it's kind of described as decoration. There's debate about its purpose and function. Um, some of it can be really reflective and white. Um, sometimes you might see trash or prey wrapped up in it. Um, so I'm not sure as far as I've been able to research that it has a um, one and done um, purpose in the web, but they do have this feature called the stable momentum and I'll have some pictures of different examples of that as we go, but very unique nonetheless. Hey, Ashley. Yeah. Um, per your request to interrupt, we do have a question about um, webs while you're yes. on it. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, Jim is asking, how do webs become solid as they start, if they start as liquid, does the air harden it, or do they combine it prior to production that causes it to solidify on the way out? That's a good question. So what it's described as is that the proteins arrange themselves as it's pooled. And so it could be a combination of air, um, but I think it's possibly more of just the material it's made out of um, is suited to that, but I'm not sure of if it's air, or if it's the tactile, like pooling tensile process. If someone else knows, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, so um, spider web uses, we've already seen the web. Um, they're also used for constructing egg cases, um, laying anchor lines. So if you've ever you know, shot a spider off the ceiling with Windex, guilty, um, you'll see that they fall and they catch themselves on an anchor line or a drag line um, to catch themselves. Um, so not all spiders build webs. Um, some of them use them for other purposes. Um, we have a lot of ground and hunting spiders that are much more um, pouncing and hunting. And so uh, we are not just using this for webs. Um, the other use that we see webs used for is ballooning. Um, so spiders can exude their silk to catch the wind and help them disperse. So this is really common when we have a, 
uh, egg hatch, the spiderlings will, you know, exude silk and it will carry them far and wide. Um, so here's a fabulous video of a spider feeling the wind and waiting and she'll turn around and let that silk come out. She's using the spinnerets to kind of pull it and then the wind takes it and off she flies. So spiders have sensitive hairs all over their body and they can feel for vibrations. They can feel um, when different spiders might be communicating to them through mating, they can feel that vibration. Um, but they also have a special organ called the trichobacteria. Uh, trichobathria. Um, and so that has an area of very, very sensitive hairs that they can even feel air movement with. And here we see what seems to be the spider kind of testing the wind, um, maybe looking for, you know, the right speed to catch that silk and go. Um, and so Dr. Gilbert Walberer, um, he was doing a study watching these spiders take off using ballooning silk. And so you see here, they have circled uh, one of the spiders that took off. And so sometimes when we look in the sky on a beautiful day, you might see little glints of silver and white and think, oh, you know, it's a dandelion fluff or it's fluff from a cottonwood. Well, it could also be a flying spider or another insect. So um, this was during a day in May, they were doing some studies and one square mile of air from 20 feet high to 500 feet high they determined that it could contain up to 32 million arthropods. That's about six arthropods per 10 cubic yards of air. So of course, this is going to include insects that can fly in those arthropods. Um, but this could also be ballooning spiders or could even be mites. So we know that there are very microscopic mites that can get caught up in the jet stream and travel for miles. Um, and so they have uh, put special traps on airplanes and they have captured spiders as high as 15,000 feet in the air um, that have been carried on their silk by the wind. And then, of course, you've probably seen this at some point in your life um, where some of that ballooning silk as they're landing, you get these nice streaks of silver. Um, and that can be a sign that um, spiders have either taken off or have landed in the area. So on with that webbing, let's talk about different web types. So there are sensing webs. And so you can see here these arrows are pointing to like um, specific anchor lines, but these are actually um, like trigger lines. And so as prey triggers that web, they will come out of their retreat and pounce. We have sheet webs and funnel webs. So not all sheet webs have retreats or funnels in them, but you're probably accustomed to seeing this one, um, you know, a grass funnel weaver, you'll see it has a nice retreat at the center or off to the side, funneling down from a sheet that catches dew beautifully. Um, but this is usually used for them to pounce onto their prey. They're not necessarily sticky. Some sheet webs will have um, intercept lines that go across um, the air above the sheet. And then as a flying insect will run into it, they fall to the ground, to the web, and the spider then pounces from the retreat. Um, so they might have um, a sheet that they camp out underneath or on the edge of it, um, or they'll have that funnel too. Then of course, the orb weavers, I told you there'd be a nice view of the stablementum here. And so again, nice little zigzags, it's much more distinct to see it, um, you know, heavy white reflective, um, but again, not so sure what the purpose is. Um, so this is our traditional round capture net. Um, it's gonna be one dimensional uh, flat surface uh, with a spoke and spiral design. And that's used for intercepting prey. And so here you're probably familiar with the um, yellow garden spider, the yellow and black garden spider. And you know this one gets a lot of heat because it's big and it's showy and oh my goodness, but she's just sitting there. She's not doing anything. Um, she is not, chasing you down um, and she's doing great work in your garden and in your landscape. But then there are space weavers and this one is kind of, I'm like, well, maybe those are sheet webs or maybe those are, you know, cackled mesh spiders, which are actually considered sheet weavers. Um, so space weavers make three-dimensional 
cobweb like webs. And so, you know, here I had my husband stand for the picture because it's hard to take pictures of webs out in the wild without some contrast. And so you can see how it kind of takes up a little bit more space. Um, and so those are space webs. So uh, now that we've gotten through our 101 introduction, let's talk about some examples in a wood near you. So what are some of the spiders we might find in the forests and woodlots of your yard and into our parks and natural areas? So we got to start with the wolf spider, because if I talk to anybody about spiders, it's always it's a wolf spider. It's a wolf spider. Everything's a wolf spider out there. Um, and so this is the one we're going to start with, because I think a lot of people know it and fear it unnecessarily. So this is going to be spiders in the family like Cosidae, and they're ground hunters and burrow nesters. So they do not build a web. Um, their burrows could have a lid on it, um, or it could be an open exposed entry that they um, retreat to and then come out to hunt and pounce. One great example of this is the woodland giant wolf spider, quote, quote. Um, a lot of these are not necessarily approved common names, but this is what you're gonna see it called um, out and about in the world. Um, this is also known as the tiger wolf spider. Um, I'm not good at Latin, so I apologize if I butcher some of this, but this is um, Tigrosa aspersa. It used to be, or may also be called in other books, Hogna aspersa. Um, so this has a very large entrance. It's one of our larger spiders. Um, they often have little bits of webbing above the entrance, kind of making like a little bit of a turret with blades of grass and debris above it. Um, they may have a lid. Here you can see this is one of our species that carries their spiderlings on their back. Um, and so this gets its name from these distinct orange bands on the leg, and it has this nice orange line on its cephalothorax, its head area right between the eyes. So those are some of the distinctive characteristics for this. Um, another wolf spider, Gladicosa gulosa, is kind of, you could say, known as a purring spider. So it's medium to large in size. It's a lighter brown color with some dark stripes that kind of converge. So if we look at the cephalothorax here, the head region of the top photo, you can see how those darker lines kind of come in a little um, at the waist and look to kind of pinch in a bit. Um, they have banded legs. Um, they're very common to deciduous forests. But one of the cool things and where it gets its name is that in communicating during courtship, it actually serenades um, its mate. Um, and so it uses its pedipalps and its um, abdomen to vibrate on leaf surfaces. And so it's communicating to the female. Now they're not hearing it the way we hear it, um, but they sense those vibrations again with those very sensitive hairs. So I'm gonna stop sharing a moment and I'm going to pull up a video to show you, or let you listen to rather, the sound of this purring. Stop sharing, share, video, optimize so you can hear it. I hope you're hearing a purring and a pat, pat, pat. Did everybody hear that? Marnie, let me know if you couldn't hear that. Sounded good. Awesome. Very so good. Um, that was um, what we described, quote, quote, as um, the purring of the spider. And so it was using its pedipalps to palpitate on a surface. And then that, that louder pat, pat, pat um, was the sound of the abdomen kind of um, hitting the ground. 
And so here, um, again, uh, jumping spiders aren't necessarily a very common one in forests, um, but you can see here, these are the pedipalps um, of this jumping spider. And so those um, were what was doing the padding. So these are pedipalps um, drumming the bongos here in this cute little picture. So moving on from our purring wolf spider, we also have our family um, of nursery web and fishing spiders that are known for extended parental care. Um, the fishing spiders are known because they um, are in close proximity to water often. Um, they might be found on water's edge, along stream banks. Um, some species can even submerge themselves in water to hide. They can walk across water or run across water in some cases. Um, but again, they're extremely large. And so people look at this and I'm sure you're thinking, that's a wolf spider. Um, but of course, it's um, a different species altogether. Um, so we have a lot of modeling and striping on the legs and on the body. You can see it doesn't have those nice bands right down the cephalothorax. Um, so they don't have those solid stripes quite as obviously as you might think of on um, the wolf spider. So one species, the dark fishing spider, is often found on tree trunks, especially if that tree trunk is near water. And so if we think about our forest um, habitat, uh, we have um, forests that might be um, include some stream banks or some bogs and um, swampy areas, and those um, might be a habitat that's attractive to our fishing spider. Um, these can um, and are known to wander into homes and buildings, um, but they can be one of our forest species. Um, here, this was a photo someone took of finding one in a uh, birdhouse. And you can see that there's a little bit of eye shine here off of this spider. And so spiders do exhibit eye shine. They have a membrane in their eye that reflects like cats. And so uh, sometimes if you're um, out looking for spiders or you want to photograph them, you can use um, a flashlight to try to find some eye shine as a way to locate them. Hey, Ashley. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, but do. Uh, I think I'm seeing it in some of your pictures, but we've been getting some questions from, from folks about size references as you kind of mm -hmm. go through. Um, if you don't have a picture like that one with the finger, maybe you can kind of tell us how big these spiders are. Sure. So these are going to be our larger species. We're going to be looking at about 10 plus millimeters. Um, and then I'm about to break into some smaller species where we're actually going to have size references um, specifically. Um, so these are just the larger ones. And here I'll try to give you as many size references as I can, but thank you. Um, so um, you saw here that this is someone's hand that they're holding, the dark fishing spider. Um, here you see someone's fingertip um, for this nursery web spider. So they are found in forest, forest understory um, and shrubs. They might be found, found along um, forest edges or that kind of transition zone where you have taller, um, less maintained foliage along the edge of a forest area. Um, they can have a lot of variety of colors. So you can see that there is a dark brown uh, version <laughs> morph um, here in the top next to this finger. And then they can be into the oranges here, as you see down at the bottom. So they can have some orange to them. They have a large stripe down the center, or you could look at it as two light stripes down the center. Um, and one of the characteristics for this species is that it holds its two, um, it's four front legs together, so in two pairs. And so they'll hold them side by side, closely together and out towards the front. Um, they get their name, the nursery web spider, because the female will carry the egg sac with her using her fangs. And then when they're ready to hatch, she will build a nursery. So here are some other photos of the same species of nursery web spider. And you can see she's carrying her egg sac with her under her abdomen, holding onto it with her fangs. Um, and then she's using these leaves here on the left to kind of start making that nursery that will protect them when they hatch. And I just love this picture of it on the far right. That is a bagworm cocoon um, that she is hanging on. Um, so quick tangent. So wolf spiders, nursery web spiders, um, our fishing spiders, they are not this spider. Um, so here you're seeing the webs of a grass funnel weaver spider. And so 
Uh, again, you might see these a lot in your fr front lawn. You might see them in shrubs. So this is a funnel weaver spider. And you can tell the difference here because these have the spinnerets sticking far out past the abdomen. So you can see this nice pointy bottom. That tells me it's a funnel weaver. Um, also has the double stripes on the cephalothorax. So it is often confused with wolf spiders. But again, wolf spiders do not make a web. And the, the grass spider here is a funnel weaver with a retreat. Um, they all can end up in homes accidentally. But I find that when, at my extension office, at least, when people bring me spiders and they're like, these giant wolf spiders are all in my house, it's usually a funnel weaver because in fall, they can start to wander around and are common home invaders. So this is not the forest wood spider. <laughs> Moving on. So uh, the wood louse hunter is another larger spider species that you would find in a forested setting. Um, bless Whitney Cranshaw for taking this spider into hand. Um, so you can see he's holding it with his fingertips for that size reference. And you can get a shot of those impressive jaws, the chelicerae. So again, the whole part is the chelicerae and the fangs are just tipped there on the chelicerae. Um, this one is a common one to run into homes too. So um, in addition, to being, you know, a forest species under rocks, under logs, they can be associated um, next to homes, especially where there's mulch and uh, their preferred food, which is the pill bug. Um, so they are woodlouse hunters. So they're going to eat those roly poly pill bugs. You can see it here on the top left um, around those food sources. Um, and then we have the trapdoor spiders. So these are another larger species. So you can see on the left, they're holding the trap, um, the actual retreat that they have created to protect themselves and hide, and then also to pounce from to collect the prey. Um, it looks here that they had a hatch. And so these are um, baby spiders, spiderlings that are crawling on his hand and finger there. So you can get a size reference there. And then the entire um, opening, you know, kind of gives you a size reference for the adults. Um, we have another video I'll get to show you here of the trapdoor spider. Um, so uh, they hold the lid closed with their fangs. Um, this uh, specific species, um, Odwin's trap spider, is uh, known to have a corky lid um, and found along banks in wooded habitat. And that makes sense because for along water areas, usually the soil might be a little more exposed, maybe a little sandy. It might make it easier for those um, burrows to be dug. So again, we're going to stop sharing and we're going to go to another video. Any questions while I pull that up? Yeah, we had one a little while back. Um, what are pedipelps? Uh, cockroach was intended as food. Ooh, maybe... Hold on, let me get this up and going. <clears throat> Optimized for sharing. There you go. I'll answer that question. Be too big because if you see when she turns around, the cockroach turns around and goes back. The trapdoor spider pulls the lid really tightly shut as if she's frightened. There you see it pulled down tight. Here's how she reacts when a suitable prey is added to the mix. Wow. Anyway, there's a slow down version here. See the fangs sink in there? Ouch. All right. So these are um, those videos are from uh, Richard Bradley's YouTube page. Doing that all week, so you'll want to um, thanks, Marcia. You'll want to keep um, checking back to that website. Um, someone's for talking. Links and resources. Denise, I think it's oh, you. We're recording this session, so once those recordings. Is something playing? Roll. Yes. There you go. That's weird. I think um, maybe something was uh, playing on. Ashley's web browser, maybe. Yeah, the next video keyed up and started playing. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Perfect. Okay. Back to our presentation. Okay. All right. 
moving on. So um, are we back on seeing the uh, presentation? Yes. Okay. So this is the um, an example of one of our orb weavers that's going to be common in our forests. Um, this is going to be the spined Oh God, Latin, microthena. Um, so this is one of the examples of a orb weaver you'll find in our forests. Um, so other species of microthena could be yellow or red, um, but they're gonna have um, different kinds of kind of spiny or like points on their abdomen. So this one has eight black points on the top of its abdomen and one pair in the rear. Um, this is a common encounter if you are a trail walker. And so we find that this species really likes to um, put its webs across open trails. The gap of that is just really um, enticing to them. And so uh, this is the one that you're going to get straight to the face if you've ever been out walking in the forest. And um, it's not the smallest spider, but sometimes they will hang out on the side of the web or um, underneath it. And so this kind of behavior where they're kind of off to the side waiting for something to come in and trigger their web. Um, we were talking earlier about when you're walking through um, the forest and you get a web to the face and you're like, oh God, where's the spider? Where's the spider? It might not even be in the web where you ran into it. So you don't need to uh, fear that so much um, because oftentimes they've run away from you. Um, so uh, this is one species that also does not wrap its prey. So when the prey hits the web, you think of the spider running out and starting to wrap it up in silk for later. Well, this one just comes out, you know, it might bite it to paralyze it and keep it from, um, you know, trying to wriggle free, but then it's just not going to wrap it up. It's going to feed on it or save it for later. So um, I want to pause here and get you to stop thinking big. And so those spiders, you know, some of them were small, but still big by our standards. Um, you might be used to thinking of, you know, giant wolf spiders. This is from Harry Potter, Agathor, you know, the big, uh, Aragorg, the big spider. Um, let's start thinking about forest spiders in millimeters now. And we're gonna move on to talk about some of our smaller species. Um, and so the pedipalps, to answer the question that I forgot about, um, are the second pair of appendages um, after the um, chelicerae. Um, they can be pinchers and scorpions. They are sensory organs and spiders. They can help to kind of clean off their eyes and their fangs. Um, and so that's what our pedipalps are. And Ashley, before you leave the, yeah. um, the spined uh, micranthina, Somebody is asking, how do they span these, the, create these webs across these very large areas? Are they using wind or how do they get across the trail? Well, that's a great question. I don't necessarily know the answer um, other than, you know, talking about their capabilities. So they could be initially um, using the ballooning technique to kind of get from um, one side to the other. They might be crawling across um, branches that are connected or touching each other. Um, so I've never seen them uh, or, or read about how they are constructed, you know, in live action to know if they are, you know, throwing web. <laughs> but, um, you know, they think about the way that a forest is arranged, you know, there's branches that are um, touching that they can walk across. And of course they can balloon. They can also drop down. So again, they can make those anchor lines and drop down and maybe even swing a little bit. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. So now let's talk about some of the small spiders of the forest. And so when we think about, um, you know, the spiders that we notice, those are some of the big ones we've just looked at and shared about, um, but a lot of the spiders in our forests are very small. Um, and a lot of the volume of spiders you might collect are going to be the smaller ones. So this is the green-legged orb weaver and they can be green to yellow to white in color, different shades. Um, and they have three pairs of spots on their 
abdomen. And so you can see that they have some um, dark black spots here on the abdomen here. Um, and they are considered, quote, a primary species of eastern deciduous forests. Um, but you can see that it's only two to three millimeters in size for our male and three to four millimeters for our female. Um, they make tightly spiraled orb webs. Um, and their egg case is going to be hidden among dry leaves. And so you may never even notice this because that tightly spiraled web is going to be, you know, comparable to their size. So you're not necessarily going to see this giant web like the spine spider that you run into face first. But here, um, this one is going to be um, a very tiny but prolific species in our forests. Now, as an entomology student, you know, when I'm out there swinging my net and doing sweep nets and trying to collect spider or insects, you might catch a spider or two. Um, and so you can see here, this tiny spider is in the fabric of a sweep net. So you can start to see that canvas pattern there. Um, and so when you sweep net a forest, you might find a lot of tiny spiders. Um, and so thinking about those small spiders, we want to think about small web spaces. And so this was a study in the Michigan entomologist that showed how different species utilized just the leaf of maple trees. So you can see how some species made sheet webs between the veins of the maple leaf and how another species might use the edges of that maple leaf to string an orb web together. Um, and so even in um, just one tree, there could be many species using its resources in different ways. Some might be camouflaging against a trunk. Some might be squeezing between crevices in the bark. And others might be utilizing the leaves and branches in different ways um, and in small ways that you might not even notice. So we also have tiny wolf spiders. Uh, we think about them as these big, um, scary, wolf spiders uh, that get into our house and we're afraid of them, but we can have tiny species as well. So these are um, examples of the Pyrata genus. Um, they can be three to five millimeters in size. Um, in one study, this species on the right, Pyrata Blaculus, um, made up 80% of the forest floor sampling that they did. Um, you can sample forest floor with pitfall traps. You could collect leaf debris and uh, soil and put it through a burlazy funnel. Um, and so those are some of the ways we might collect these spiders. And it just made up a huge portion of that forest floor sample. Um, another species, Parada minimus, um, is found in woodlands as well as fields, meadows, and lawns. So it's not just restricted to forests. We might find them in many habitats. Um, members of the Haneid are considered comb tail spiders. Um, they are called comb tail spiders because instead of having a circle of spinnerets at the back of their abdomen, they have a line of spinnerets like a comb. Um, and they are a family of very small spiders um, that make ground surface webs. And so they might build sheets. Um, they would um, be between layers of decomposing leaves and litter um, in the forest. You can see these examples of webbing here. And one example from this family um, could be, um, I didn't put the name on this one. Well, this is Gryphacea montana. And again, I'm really bad at Latin, so I do apologize. Um, and so this has a distinct patterned abdomen. As you can see kind of this um, pattern on its abdomen that kind of gives it away. Again, we're looking at millimeters in size. Um, and they're going to be um, making these small uh, sheet webs in the leaf litter and the duff inner forest floor. Another example of a forest spider we might find is going to be the triangle spider in the family Ulboridae. I have another fantastic video from Richard Bradley's YouTube to share you. Um, members of the Ulboridae do not have venom. And again, they're small in millimeters to centimeters in size. And they make cribellate webs, which I will talk about after I pull up the video. This is going to be Hyptioides.
go. I wish Zoom was better at transitioning between videos. Holding onto her web, which is triangle shape, hence the name, against a contrasting background. She holds it under tension very tightly and spools the threads of her silk line uh, and holds them tightly with a little bit of slack. And you can see the little balls of, tra of silk there. Here she is holding her web. Now there's a long gap because we're waiting for this uh, fly and just wait for it. Eventually, there you go, seeing the fly drop into the web. Now she jerks in, jerks in, jerks in. As she's jerking, what she's doing is releasing the tension on the line and allowing the web to collapse on the prey and entangle it even more. Now she's approaching it. Unfortunately, I didn't have the aim exactly right. But as you can see, she's getting close to the bottom here. And you can see the fly right there at the edge. I'm going to move the camera here in a second. And you'll be able to see her beginning to wrap her hard-won prey here. Now I've moved it. You can see the fly next to the little spider. And uh, finally focuses here and you can see her actually beginning to wrap. Okay. So again, you saw that um, jerking motion. So she's holding that web under elastic tension and then she is able to release the web and it collapses in around the spite, the prey. So I mentioned that they use, uh, they have a cribellum that creates cribellate web. And so we think of webbing as sticky, that it has a gluey tactile stickiness to it uh, when we're trying to capture things. But cribellate web is actually just tiny, tiny, tiny single threads that when they group together to make a strand, create a kind of sticky surface like Velcro. So by virtue of the surface area of those tiny, tiny threads, it creates an adhesive stickiness without actually being gluey. Um, and so it's more of a Velcro action that it uses to cling to rough surfaces on its prey on insects. Um, so even on something you think of as smooth, like maybe the back of a ladybug, for example, that uh, elytra, that first pair of wings, it's shiny, it has that red and black spot, but there are tiny, tiny you know, bumps on those surfaces that the cribellate um, webs can adhere to um, using that surface structure. Um, and that is how they actually are able to capture their prey in their webs. So this species is common um, near dead branches and understory canopies of forests. And again, it gets its name from that triangle shape. It has four lead radial lines coming out from a center point. Um, and it would be found like you saw there, maybe in a bench in your forest or in the crotch of a dead tree um, on its branches. So we already saw the video, there you go. Another spirit you would run into in the forest would be the pirate spiders um, in the family Mimididae, um, and they are specialists in feeding on other spiders. They don't build their own web, um, and they will um, pluck the strings on a web um, to get the female to, or the owner of the web, um, the female to come out, and then they will ambush them and feed on the spiders of other webs. Um, and they may also steal any prey that is in the web. Um, so they eat the host and possibly its prey as well. So close up on our pirate spider, you can see it has a lot of distinct kind of spines on their legs. And that's one of the distinctive features for identifying this and kind of uh, black and white um, modeled appearance in this um, species. Another one we'll run into are the bull and doily spiders, um, Frontinella communis or Fontanella pyramitella. Again, apologies on the Latin. Um, so these are common in understory herbaceous vegetation. And so this is another kind of the sheet webs where you see they build this bowl um, that has kind of a, a curved nature and the spider sits underneath it 
um, above the doily, so this flat web that then is laid underneath it. Um, they have a lot of intercept lines above the bowl. So as things fly into those um, tangled webs above, they get knocked down into the bowl where the spider finishes it off. Um, these are a very widespread species and they are common for ballooning far and wide on the wind. Um, so they're easy to ID by the web. So that's a very distinct web, but also the spider itself is pretty distinct too. So you can see that um, this one is going to have um, some pretty distinct white and brown to black markings. And you can see that she is not very, very small. So this is one that's going to be more on the centimeter size. Better for photographing. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the bola spider because that's just the most fascinating behavior. And this is the one that got me into learning more about spiders was when I learned about the bola spiders. So these spiders are named because of a weapon that's wielded by Argentinian gauchos. So a string with a ball at the end that they can swing and hit things with. Um, so the spider is doing just that with her silk. Um, so she is going to be a capturing um, hunter, not necessarily with a web, but using her silk to fling at prey and reel them in like a fisherman. Um, but this spider can actually produce chemicals that mimic moth pheromones. So that's what really got me interested. And so it can actually exude a smell of the sex pheromones of moth species so that they come in saying, hey, where's the lady? And then while the moth is coming in looking to mate, she is able to aim her bola and strike the moth with the sticky end of her silk and reel it in and lasso the moth. So there's a lot of great videos, again, on Richard Bradley's YouTube page um, of the bolas being made and capturing a moth. We're just going to look at one video um, of the swinging bolas. So give me one second to once again, pull up that video and we'll just, over here. So you can see kind of a string with a, the bundled up silk at the end that is the sticky end. She is pulling this from her spinnerets. There's a moth flying by now. Bring in a mist. So she missed the moth, but you can see how they were attracted and came in. But you can see how she was swinging the bola, which is her own silk. And so the silk, again, is pulled from the spinnerets. And as it's pulled, it starts to bunch up at the end. And so the end it looks like a droplet of spit here in this picture, but it's actually bundled up um, webbing. And then she uses that to swing it. And then it'll stick to the moths if she's able to aim right. Think about the kid toys you played with that you'd get out of the vending machines that had like a sticky hand on a string. Then you'd throw it at your brother and you'd throw it at the window. That's what we're doing here with our silk. Um, and so she is able to not only attract moths, but we know also that the juveniles can attract moth flies or owl flies in the um, genus Psychota. So here, this is a drain fly. It's a filth fly that you might find in um, your bathroom or in public bathrooms. They're really adorable and fuzzy. Um, so the juvenile bolas can uh, exude a smell that attracts these. And then we'll also see them attract moths like the bristly cutworm. So these are both considered um, undesirable species. Um, so the cutworm is an often a pest in um, corn and, and agriculture. Um, it, the moth fly, the owl fly is a um, 
filth species associated with sewage. Um, and so these are both things that we'd be very happy to have the bola spider eating. All right, so those were some of the examples for our forests. Quickly, I just want to share that spiders have other roles. Their silk is nest glue for hummingbirds, goldfinches, furios, indigo buntings, warblers. And so um, not only are they beneficial hunters and predators of our forests, but they're providing a material that's needed by many birds. They're also a great food source for birds. Um, this is a house wren with a spider in its mouth. They're also a food source for a lot of uh, other insects too. So this is a, a mud dauber wasp that constructs a pipe organ mud nest that are pretty amazing in their own right, but stuffed in those mud tubes are paralyzed spiders. Um, and so she stings and paralyzes spiders um, and then she lays an egg, those eggs hatch and they consume the spider alive in their nest. Another insect that requires spiders are the mantid fly. And so the mantid fly is a beautiful, fantastic, amazing predator that we really want to encourage. And um, it's related to our lace wings. They have beautiful nerve uh, wings, four wings of equal length, but they're very rare to find in Ohio, even though we do have them. Um, and it's because um, partially their life cycle is fraught with challenges. So the eggs hatch, the larva has to crawl along and hunt for a spider, and then they have to ride the spider back to the spider's retreat. Uh, there they will eat spider eggs. If the mantid fly cannot find a spider or get the larva back to the retreat where the eggs are, it can't finish its life cycle. So it has to feed on spider eggs. And so that's a very tricky life to have, um, but uh, definitely requires spiders um, for its life. Um, just some final fun facts. Um, I know we're out of time, but um, do not use the monkey balls, the Osage orange uh, fruit. They do not repel spiders. Um, there was a study that found that um, extracted components of this fruit, Osagin, um, might deter cockroaches, but not enough data to say that um, And it really is a deterrent for spiders and the fruit absolutely is not. Um, they found uh, better luck with chestnut oil and um, mint oils than they did with um, Osagin and Osage Orange. Same with other uh, things like lemon oil, it did nothing to repel spiders. Um, and again, chestnut oil and mint oil did better at repelling two species of spiders. So a lot of myths on um, repellents. And then just a funny haha, -ha, um, daddy long legs are not true spiders. Um, they're opilionies, they're not arenii. So um, if you thought daddy long legs were real spiders, they are not. So when you have seen one ant, one bird, one tree, one spider, you have not seen them all. And so with that, we'll take any final questions and I'll put up here that these are my grail spider books, um, all by Richard Bradley here in Ohio, um, in Ohio's backyard spiders, um, the new common spiders of North America and um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources has a common spiders of Ohio field guide that's for free um, to download as a PDF um, at the ODNR website. And that's a really great one to get you started with spiders as well. Questions. I see a lot in the Q and A box. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was so good. About like five minutes ago, I was like, "Oh, it seems like she's wrapping up. Why? Oh my gosh, it's been an hour. <laughs> it went <has. laughs> so fast. <laughs> so cool. All kinds of great information. Thank you so much. And yes, we do have some questions. Uh -huh. Um. So, uh, Carolyn, the first question we had was from Carolyn, and it was kind of that question we already answered about spiders spanning large areas. And um, I will say that, uh, so Rich Bradley is on and he did answer the question with a little bit more detail. Thank um, you. In the chat box. So he said they release silk in a slight breeze and it crosses the gap they tested or they test. And when it gets stuck at the other side, they pull taut and then reinforce by going across with a heavier line behind. So thank you, Rich, for that. Thank you, um, Rich. Yeah. I, I can't believe Richard Bradley is on this. Oh my God. <laughs> I didn't want to tell you that. Big, big, fan big fan moment. Big fan moment. Yeah. Okay. So um, 
James was asking, uh, he asked about if they are poisonous and hang on a second, because I think he was talking about the, um, oh, which one was it? I think it was the uh, dark fishing spider. And if that's not right, James, um, uh, let me know. But I guess maybe generally some of the, the spiders that you mentioned sure. um, talk about if there are poisonous or is it correct to say venomous like it is with snakes? Yeah, so poison is something you ingest, venom is something that is injected. So we'll be looking at venomous. Um, so there are only two species that are considered medically important in Ohio, and that's the brown recluse and the black widow. They're not necessarily considered forest spiders. Um, and that's because they're, the reaction to those venoms is more um, significant for our health. Uh, a lot of spiders have venom. You can say, I don't want to say all spiders, are venomous because there are spiders that don't have venom, um, but um, they have it to paralyze and um, immobilize their prey. Um, and so um, it's just because it's venom, quote, quote, doesn't mean it's harmful or medically dangerous to us. People react to bites in different ways, just like we have people who react to bee stings in different ways. Some people have anaphylaxis and are, you know, deathly allergic to bees, but bees themselves are not, you know, poisonous, um, quote, quote. Um, and so, um, I know I've been bitten by a spider on my face and half my face went numb for a day. Um, I've been oh. bitten and gotten blisters. Um, it's just depends on your own body, um, and its reaction to that. But again, we only have two species that are considered medically important. There hasn't been a death from a black widow spider since like the seventies. Um, so it's not something I'm terribly concerned about, but you can react to it and swell up and itch and things like that. <laughs> So Rich said, excellent an answer. How come I've never been bitten? <laughs> <laughs> well, I smacked a spider that uh, ballooned in my car window and I went, ah! and that's how I got bit. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think that's a good point. I mean, and maybe I'm wrong here, but I think a lot of folks think that they just crawl on you and then bite you. But no. isn't it true that you have to really threaten yes. them, really bother them to actually get them to react like that. Yeah. So I've never been bitten by a spider. <laughs> I've handled, um, it is when you have that reaction or you step into something or you like squish it in a, on a branch or you're climbing a tree, um, or you're handling, um, leaf material that you're cleaning up outside. So I should just leave your leaves guys. Um, and you're yeah. outside. Um, so you even saw that picture of Whitney Cranshaw holding the woodlouse spider and he was holding the body, the abdomen, and you could see the chelicerae and it wasn't trying to necessarily bite him like aggressively it was just like ah um so you can handle them safely it's just when we are out in their environment and i would say being careless because we're just not even thinking about it but you know wear long sleeves wear gloves when you're picking up leaf piles debris wood things like that and that'll help you yeah so true of um, so many wildlife species if you leave them alone they'll leave you alone yeah, and same okay. for Carolyn, do wolf and fishing spiders bite if handled? Again, just don't crush them. You can let them crawl across your hand, um, keep your hand flat, you know, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Diane, I'm not sure which species you were referring to when you said, why do these look so shiny? So um, if you want to clarify that, go ahead and put it in the Q&A and we'll search down for that. But we'll move on to Mary's question. Um, does spider size include its legs or just the body? Oh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I am assuming it includes the leg width, but I can't confirm that. And maybe, uh, Dr. Bradley, he says, usually body only. Thank yeah. you. That, that is important because I mean, you feel like you, sometimes you were like, it was this big, but you know, like yeah. the legs and sometimes shadow and makes it look a lot bigger anyways. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jim is asking, <clears throat> um, that you, he said that you usually refer to web builders as females. Do males build webs? Sometimes. Um, I usually consider them, and this is not true, it's probably species by species. Um, but, you know, if you have the female who is um, making a area for the eggs and stuff, it's going to be, you know, the female is going to be the one building it. But men can, the males can use silk too. Um, and so they do have spinnerets and the ability to make silk. Right. I'm going to jump to a comment in the chat before I, I, I lose it. Um, Richard said he was told by a pest exterminator years ago that there was an average 1000 spiders of different species in our home. Any truth yeah. to that? Well, I think that there are um, a lot of insects 
critters, mites, spiders that are in our homes, in between the walls, in the attics. I don't know about a thousand um, or what they based that on, but you know, I have um, exterminators in my family as well, ironically. And uh, yeah, they would uh, testify that there are a lot of critters that we don't know. Um, even if we're just thinking about like, um, again, tiny spiders um, in the spaces and the eaves and the, um, in between the bricks, you know, it, it, it adds up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen is requesting uh, that you tell us a little bit about the trash line spiders. Dr. Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I know the trash line spiders, you know, they have, you know, a line that extends down and yeah. it fills with their um, food um, and, and spent waste, but any additional um, would be coming from Dr. Bradley at this point. You can let me talk. Yeah. Add them on. Bring yeah. I was just going to, I was just going to ask, give me a, a, give me a second to find you in the attendee. <laughs> if list. we have the resource here, let's use it. Okay. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to put them on the spot, but if you are willing, we'd <laughs> love to have you. You did this to yourself. You came. <laughs> okay, I, I have to scroll down and, oh my goodness. Okay, there you are. How amazing. Okay, I'm promoting you to panelist, Rich. You might just have to accept something that popped up on your screen, and then you should be able to join us. There he is. Yes, Kathy wrote that we could do a whole program on house spiders. Yes. You know, I was trying to stick very much to forests. <laughs> great, great program, Ashley. I'm just <laughs> so impressed. It was so, you, you didn't oh, I'm so glad I didn't know you were on before though I died. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just the topic of the, of the um, trash line orb waivers, there are two different species common in Ohio. Uh, one of them's called Cyclosa conica. The other is called Cyclosa turbinata. I think turbinata is maybe a little more frequently encountered, at least by me. Uh, anyway, they're both pretty small spiders. Even when they get to be full size, they're, they're pretty small by most people's measure, but they're really common in force. So it's a great one for your talk I'll today. <laughs> uh, usually people notice their webs because of this tabellamentum. And in that species, those um, two species, the stabilimentum is, it starts out as being a silk fluffy thing, sort of a little bit like the um, yellow garden spider, the big spectacular zigzag one, but, but on, a, on a much, much smaller scale. But then they decorate it with junk and they literally, they'll even go down and pick up pieces of leaf from the leaf litter below uh, sometimes they leave bits and pieces of their previous prey that actually that's pretty common. So it's almost like a way of figuring out where all of the, what they've been eating. Cause you can look at all the bits and pieces. You'd have to be a great entomologist, but you can look at the bits and pieces in their uh, stabilimentum. Anyway, it, that's why it's called a trash line. It's because it's got all this miscellaneous stuff in it. And at the end of their life cycle, uh, the females, also incorporate their egg case into the stabilimentum with all the trash. And they, they coat their egg case with a similar material. So it looks just like another piece of trash. So I think maybe one of the primary purposes, just guessing here, I don't, I've never done experiments on this, but I'm guessing that the egg case is kind of camouflaged uh, and protected by that uh, sort of junky surroundings. But anyway, so that's what I was gonna add about them. But listen, that, was a great talk. I wouldn't really need to add anything. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, going back to the question that Diane had about why are they so shiny, she was referring to, I think, the bowl and doily spiders. She said the ones that were white and brown that you showed close to the end. I do recall those being shinier as well. Well, I don't know if they are necessarily shinier or if someone was using a flash when they took the picture, yeah. but um, uh, their bodies are less um, pubescent. And so that might give rise to them having a little more of a reflective surface, which is true Excellent. of a lot of insects too. Yeah. Okay. So Frank's asking about, um, I think it's the 
I call them bogus butt spiders. <laughs> Spiky butt like, spiders. Yeah, yeah, spiky butt spiders. But he's wondering why do they build the nests like at face height? Is there a reason why they're building them at that specific height? And then why do you see webs more often in August or, or late summer? Right. So, um, you know, our spiders are reaching, you know, maturity, um, different spiders hatch at different times. Um, and so by late summer, you're starting to see kind of the like peak populations of spiders. Um, and that could be one reason why you're seeing them more than I know that um, in fall, we have a lot more wandering spiders that enter into homes because they're seeking out mates and trying to find places to um, seek warmer shelter. Um, and so that's when we most often run into them in homes that's when my calls kind of peak at the extension office. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why they choose um, face height um, as much as, you know, it could be um, competition for space. If there are other spiders and critters out there, um, it could be you know, a good height for running into moths and, and flying insects, you know, because they do fly around that height. Um, we're trying to stay underneath the canopy. So if I'm a moth or a flying insect, um, you know, I'm going to be flying in those open spaces and not necessarily up where the leaves are, um, but not too close to the ground where, you know, there might be um, rodents and other predators that they might be trying to avoid or just um, trying to avoid collisions. And so it's just a good height in my own untested experience that, you know, would be good for moths and butterflies and flies and bees of the forest. Um, yeah. Yep. So. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Chris is asking, can you discuss biomimicry related to spiders? I can't. <laughs> Rich. <laughs> Rich. Yeah, I'm not sure what what they're choosing as biomimicry, but there there are some flies, for example, that have wing patterns and abdominal coloration that makes them look a little bit like a jumping spider. Yeah, and, and they perch on leaves and they'll move their wings in ways that and their body in a way that makes it almost look like they're a little jumping spider approaching and perhaps perhaps that's helpful at deterring predation uh, that's the hypothesis there but I don't, I don't know how good the tests of that have been there are also um uh, well i've forgotten how there was there was another example i saw uh published of a uh, uh another insect which had a spider-like pattern with a similar thing, but now it's escaped my memory what it was. But, but the, the fr flies are mostly uh, in the fruit fly family to I think. Um, but yeah, no, I, you could probably look that up and get more information. Uh, some of it might even be correct off the internet, uh, but uh, you know, I'm not an expert on the, on the biomimicry part of it either, but that, that's one example I know of. Uh, that's been uh, frequently published. Jim McCormick, who's a, a good naturalist of Ohio, he has a blog and talked about there's a moth that mimics a jumping spider. Um, so there's another a moth that mimics a spider. I don't know if there's anything that spiders, oh, okay. they themselves are great. Yeah, predators. that's probably where I heard it. Yeah. Um, and then um, there uh, obviously are spiders that mimic like ants and things to, you know, they look like um, ants, and then they can sneak up on their prey. Mm. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess I should have thought about the other way around where the, the spider is the one doing the mimicry. You're right. There are <laughs> quite a few jumping spiders and a whole bunch of uh, other ground spiders that mimic the activities of ants. They even, some of them will walk on six legs and mm. wave two legs as if they were almost They're like antennas. antennae. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> it's, a, it's another thing, a behavioral way to make themselves look a little bit more like an ant. And presumably all this is because ants are pretty nasty prey for a lot of animals. They don't like ants partially because they taste bad, but also because they're pretty well defended. Um, yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah, you're right. That's a, that's a, I should have remembered that. I wasn't sure which way he was talking. So I'm like, I don't know if spiders need to mimic anything, but no, that's right. Um, and then James, you asked why do spiders balloon its dispersal? Um, you know, if they need to um, spread so that they're not competing with one another when they hatch, um, it could be to find a better habitat, um, possibly other reasons, but mainly dispersal. Excellent. And I think the last question, smallest spider found in Ohio. Ooh. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, some of the ones I shared, you know, in that two millimeter range seem pretty small, but uh, Rich, if you know definitively who it is, you're welcome to share. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it it's probably some juvenile spider. Oh yeah. <laughs> when they, but, that makes uh, sense. Yeah, they all, they all start very, very small. Even the largest eggs uh, of the big burrowing uh, trapper spiders, which are pretty big, the their larvae. I mean, their you know first instars are very small, uh, and the first emerging thing it comes out of the egg case, the second instar most of the time very small, but it'll be a linifeid. Uh, one of the small linifeids, like maybe a Tapinosaiba, uh, would be one of the smallest ones for Ohio. But of course, there's a lot of individual variation too. I always point this out to people. Uh, you know, they, when they tell me that the spider in their kitchen was six inches long, I say, well, there is a lot of individual variation in size, but that would be, that would be very big. But as you know, people who are frightened of spiders tend to see them as much larger than most of us would measure them with a ruler and and, and it's a it's a it's a psychological thing and it's a normal human reaction i think anybody who saw a bear would probably think it was 10 times bigger if it was actually approaching <laughs> that's very true <laughs> All right. Well, that's all the questions. Um, I do have Ashley a comment from Brenda in the chat about um, she has a picture of picture of ballooning baby spiders uh, that a gardener asked her about. Oh. Um, so she's wondering if she could send you the picture and uh, you could kind of confirm it with her. So if you um, uh, want to put your email in the chat uh, or Brenda, you can share your email with Ashley, however you want to do that. But lots of comments coming in, Ashley, about um, how great your talk was. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Bradley, thank you so much yes. for chiming in as well. It's <laughs> really made this just that little extra even better. So we really appreciate that. Um, and so I'm going to stop the recording at this point. And Kathy is going to uh, pop up that.